welcome to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Edward Russell, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jay Shabat, to discuss earnings at JetBlue, Air France, KLM, and IAG, and their outlooks. Enjoy. Hey, Jay, how's your week going? Oh, all good. All good, Ned. How about you? Going well. We're still in the thick of earnings here. We've, uh, this is, uh, you know, we're recording this on Wednesday, August 2nd, and this week alone we have JetBlue, Frontier, Spirit, Lufthansa, um, Allegiant. So the list goes on and on. Japan Airlines, Indigo, list goes on and <laughs> on. Absolutely. But today we're going to talk about uh, three airlines. We'll talk about JetBlue before the break, and then afterwards we'll talk a little bit about Europe and look at IEG and Air France KLM's results. But Jay, tell us, how did JetBlue do in uh, in the second quarter? Okay, so as usual, we'll start with some, some numbers, some of the headline numbers from, from the second quarter. So JetBlue did not do particularly well in relative terms relative to its other, to its peers, its U.S. peers. So Operating margin came in at 9.9%, call it 10%. Um, I just wanted to take a second. I did get a couple of uh, emails uh, asking, you know, from some people who may be new, new to the industry or or in different parts of the industry where you're not dealing with these financial numbers so much. I just wanted to quickly mention that when I talk about operating results, when Ned and I, you know, use that phrase, well, we're really good. We're just all we're doing is we're going to the income statement that airlines will file typically every quarter. And uh, income statement is just a synonym for profit and loss statement. And they'll uh, they'll have a revenue number and they'll have an operating profit number, which excludes uh, costs related to you know interest on debt and taxes, but all the other costs pretty much uh, dumped into that. And then we just divide that operating profit divided by revenues. And that's what that uh, that operating margin is. And if anybody has any questions, just you know, you feel free to email us or give us a call. We're happy to walk walk it through you, walk it through with you. So okay, 10% for JetBlue. Um, you can compare it to Alaska if you want, which is 18%. So almost double. Uh, and JetBlue, you know, Ned, you can talk about maybe some of the highlights of their call. I'll just say this: every time I listen to a JetBlue call, I think they might as well just make a recording every quarter. And just, you know, say something like uh, the Northeast was uh, more difficult operationally than we expected. It was uh, we had to cancel more flights. We had to <laughs> delay more flights. Uh, but don't worry, it'll get better <laughs> in the future. And uh, that's the reason for our disappointing results. That seems like the recurring uh, theme of Je- every JetBlue call. Just put it on repeat. I mean, it's true. Put they, on repeat. <laughs> yeah, they they warned in April that uh, about potential air traffic control impacts in New York, and and we were a little skeptical, and they played out. And, and the truth is, is JetBlue could, because so much of their capacity is in New York and Boston. I think they said around fifty percent or something. They have a much higher impact from weather, air traffic control delays, all those things at JFK, then, then United Airlines, which actually got a lot more press about their disruptions at Newark than JetBlue did, even though it arguably is much bigger impact on JetBlue's broader system. But that played out in June and July, and they expect it to continue in August. And <laughs> that is is hurting the results, like you said, Jay. You know, they, they definitely highlighted that in their call. But you know, the thing that really hit me and the thing I was listening for was the impact from ending the Northeast Alliance with American Airlines. You know, JetBlue and American lost their case against the DOJ in May and were forced to unwind it. And JetBlue uh, decided not to appeal and to unwind that last month in July. And so really, this call is the first time we've seen the cost of that. And it's going to be a big one. So JetBlue doesn't, hasn't put exact revenue numbers to what the Northeast Alliance uh, get, brought them in or what it cost them. But they did give uh, an earnings per share impact. And, and Jay, you've told me how we can't read too much into exactly what that is in terms of profit. But earnings per share impact will be about a fifth of their full year outlook. Now, of course, that number can be um, fudged by buying back shares or doing something else. But I mean, a fifth, a cut by their full year outlook by a fifth is not insignificant by at least a fifth, I should say. So it's a big cost for JetBlue. And it's really, (laughs) they might lose money in the third quarter, which is pretty impressive considering that is a peak summer travel season. Yeah, they they actually say they might lose money in the third quarter. I Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, their guidance is down to flat. So yeah. 
Yeah, it's they they definitely have a lot of issues. I mean, you mentioned the Northeast Alliance and, and these air traffic control. We we joke about it, um, but uh, you know it's something that always comes up in their calls. But this operational uh, distress in markets like New York and Boston that that's that's serious and it's getting worse. I mean, weather patterns are getting worse, weather disruptions are getting worse, and air traffic control shortages are you know worse than they ever were. And I think that's one of the reasons why JetBlue just feels like it has to do something radical and hence the Jeff, the, the, sorry, the spirit merger, um, yep. which will, you know, that that's, I think that's one, one reason why they, why they feel they have to do something like that. And that would, if, if, if approved, uh, the spirit merger would in fact diversify them away from the Northeast. Yep. Uh, quite that's a, a big, that's a big if, it's a big if, you know, there's still a case pending with the DOJ against the merger that will go to right. court in October. So <laughs> big if. Right, right. So they're, uh, you know, got their, they've got their fingers crossed on that. Uh, now it does, doesn't really do anything to mitigate their exposure to Florida. Florida seems to be okay. Um, I don't think that's really their biggest problem. Uh, their transatlantic stuff they said was very good, but it's still small. It's only, you know, it's only a couple of routes. Uh, I did the numbers that. and it's 3% of their third quarter capacity is in transatlantic. So, so almost um, trivial. Yeah. yeah. So they, yes, I think, I yes. think it's, it's doing well, but not having a huge impact. Uh, they didn't really talk about transcon other than they said the mint uh, sort of first, first class product, which they, that, you know, it's kind of a high level premium product that they deploy on a lot of their transcon routes. That's doing well. Again, not too much of a surprise, because we know that premium leisure is a very hot, uh, hot market right now. So that's doing Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think Caribbean Florida is okay. I mean, first quarter tends to be more peak season than second quarter for those markets, but no problems there. Um, I, th I think it's just a couple of things. I think it's some of those short haul business markets in the Northeast. Which they uh, highlighted. Like, they highlighted that, yeah. that, you know, the slower recovery in New York coupled with, you know, fewer people flying short haul is makes some of those their, their weakest markets. Yep. Yep. And, and and New York in general, I think is just weak. And part of it is, you know, just, just all these, uh, there's probably people reluctant to fly because of how operational and messy things are. And then, you know, combined with the fact that New York has been slower to recover just overall in terms of, you know, whether it be business travel or whatnot um, from the pandemic. So New York is definitely an issue for them right now. They, you know, they said, well, that's, uh, you know, that's because that's going to recover, you know, that that's maybe slower to recover when it does recover, that'll be upside for us. And, you know, we'll see, but, uh, but it's not a, um, you know, JetBlue's definitely, it, it's been a chronic underperformer for many years now, and it hasn't really done anything convincing to, uh, you know, suggest that's going to change. Uh, does the spirit merger, you know, kind of create a new paradigm? They they hope so, and we'll see if it goes through. But as of now, uh, it's yeah, it's not a. Now I want to. I think it's very important to, to kind of step back and be be clear that the whole U.S. airline industry is structured now, where everybody is is making money. I mean, Hawaiian is a bit of an exception, but uh, it's probably the lone lone exception. But, you know, let's be clear that JetBlue still made a 10% operating margin. I mean, if this was, you know, 2005 or 2006, that, that would be a huge accomplishment. You know, right now, that sounds disappointing because of what everyone else is making. Um, so JetBlue is making money. It's not a not going to go bankrupt. It's not losing money, but definitely underperforming its peers. Absolutely. And and that underperformance looks like it might last through at least the end of the year. I mean, like you said, it could last much longer. But the the hits that they were talking about in their call this week really look at the second half of 2023. And they have some optimism for 2024, but it's hard to say what's going to happen in 2024. We'll have to uh, see how the demand environment shapes up and everything works out for that. Yeah. And that, by the Jay, way, let's they... take a... oh, yeah. Oh, I, I sorry. I always get those last minute interjections there. <laughs> sorry, to, um, but I uh, just just wanted to say that that ten percent margin they did in Q two that was actually worse than they did in Q two of two thousand and nineteen. They did a twelve percent operating margin. Uh, now that's not totally uncharacteristic. Southwest, for example, was worse this year than in twenty nineteen. Frontier was worse this year, but uh, but Southwest, but but sorry, but Alaska was better. Delta United and American were better. 
So uh, yeah, just keep that in mind. JetBlue, JetBlue has regressed since the pandemic. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. With that, we'll take a quick break and we'll be back to talk about Europe. Hey, Jay, we're jumping over the pond and we're going to talk about IAG and Air France KLM. Why don't you, you take, uh, take the lead with Air France KLM? You covered them uh, during their earnings last week. Okay, I'm going to uh, throw a lot of numbers at everybody, so please be uh, be be ready here. Okay, so let's do Air France KLM first. So operating margin, ten percent, just like JetBlue. So uh, you know, not not doesn't blow anybody away there. Uh, now let's break that down though. Air France itself did a little bit higher than ten percent. KLM did eight percent. And then Transavia, which is a pretty sizable low-cost carrier, they have a French arm, they have a Dutch arm, that broke even. It's a little disappointing there. Okay, but bottom line, the whole company did 10%. Now let's go to IAG. IAG, 16%. So IAG, a lot more, it's, it's a much more profitable company than Air France Canada. Yes. That's nothing new. That's, I, you know, we could have been talking about that 10 years ago. It just, it's been like that for many years now. And if I break that down, British Airways actually underperformed. Um, they Their operating margin was only 13%. They actually regressed us uh, from 2019. Now, the real superstars were Iberia and Vueling. The Spanish market is doing extremely well for two reasons. One, Spanish leisure markets, just fantastic. And then also uh, South American markets, uh, very, very strong. Spain to South America right now. Uh, so Iberia, 17% margin, Vueling, 18% margin. And then finally, Aer Lingus up in Ireland, they did fantastically well at 18%. Again, no surprise because Transatlantic is just, you know, gangbusters. As, gangbusters. As, yeah, as, as we've heard from so many calls now. So, yeah, there are your numbers. So, you know... The numbers are good out of both airlines. Um, you know, there's still some some things going on, some restructuring. But you know, one thing that jumped out at me was they're not seeing any of the yield declines that we're seeing in the U.S. And IAG broke out their numbers by region, so we could see just Europe take out all the international because, like you said, transatlantic's gangbusters. And actually, European yields were their strongest in the second quarter um, across the group, rising, let's see, in Europe, 18%, and domestic markets, that would include domestic Spain, 19%. And I thought that was really fascinating that yields are still going up in Europe, you know, even at, it, whereas in domestic US, it's not. It's uh, It really shows, I mean, you could argue Europe's a year, six months, a year behind the US in the recovery, but travel demand is robust and it's not letting up, at least not at this point. Right. So remember that Americans this summer are traveling to Europe more than ever. In fact, many, many Americans are saying, okay, this year is going to be my European trip. I'll do domestic another time. Now in Europe, Europeans is different. Europeans are not necessarily going to the US in much, much larger numbers. And the reason why is mostly exchange rates, I think. You know, the dollar yep. has been very strong. So Europeans yep. are still uh, having normal travel patterns in terms of, you know, going to visit Spain, you know, someone from London going to visit from Spain, someone from Germany going to visit Greece, whatever. Some, so I think there's a lot. So I think that's one reason why the short haul has uh, has not seen the yield declines um, within Europe, as you mentioned. Uh, now, for these airlines, they don't really care if it's Europeans or Americans sitting on their planes because the fact of the matter is transatlantic for both of these carriers, IAG and Air France KLM, were the superstar performers. And that's the reason why they, you know, they did all relatively well. I mean, Air France, we mentioned a little bit disappointing, but uh transatlantic, and they they love when as particularly Air France KLM, because its network is just kind of spread out all over the globe, more so than IAG. Uh, they love it when the transatlantic, uh, North Atlantic and South Atlantic do well because it's less competitive. You know, when they go east, Air France has a lot of exposure to Asia, for example, East Africa, uh, you know, parts of even, I mean, just all of Asia. And that starts to get very yield competitive because you're competing against Turkish airlines on many itineraries, 
you're competing against the Gulf carriers. So they love it when demand is like really strong on the North Atlantic and, you know, Air France and KLM can team up with Delta and price together. And they, they just surely made a huge amount of money on those transatlantic routes this summer, as did Delta United American. We know that from their call as well. Um, now, the one thing that's interesting about Air France, KLM, and IAG, in addition, is that they were very clear that South America, the South Atlantic stuff, you know, Brazil to Europe, Argentina to Europe, that stuff is doing very, very well right now as well. And that's helping yes. the Spanish markets in particular. Absolutely. And that South Atlantic strength is uh, one reason why we're seeing so many airlines European airlines look south, you know, uh, Lufthansa has talked about it in their takeover of ITA Airways in, in Italy, um, which we'll learn more about this week. Uh, Air France KLM as keeps talking about TAP Air Portugal, though, you know, still waiting for the government there to decide on the privatization. And of course, IAG is, is pushing forward with their takeover of Air Europa, which would strengthen their position across the South Atlantic and would also expand the Madrid hub. So, you know, they're definitely investing and growing in that region, you know, all three groups rather than than East, like you say, which is just far more competitive. There's just so many more competitors flying between Europe and and India and Asia and the Gulf and everything. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I want to add one more thing about Air France KLM is that yep. their balance sheet is real messy right now. And balance sheet is simply, again, I know there's some people on this call who maybe new to the industry or, or new to finance, but uh, it's just simply their, you know, what uh, their assets and their liabilities, what they owe, what they, what they own. And it's actually in negative territory. They, they, their liabilities are greater than their assets right now, which is not a good situation to be in. So they're, what they're, they're doing a couple of different interesting, you know, interesting things to raise money. One of the things that there's actually, they're, uh, they're doing a frequent flyer transaction where they're going to create uh, kind of a new company for their flying blue, pro blue program, just like uh, you, you know, IAG has the same sort of setup with Avios, and then they're gonna, you know, raise money that way by uh, you know, selling some bonds through that and whatever gets get some private equity investors involved, and um, you know, they that's a that's a big priority. They need to get their balance sheet sort of back in order, especially if they want to buy Tap Air Portugal, which they continue to express interest in. Um, yes. and, uh, you know, and then the good thing of course, is they are, you know, their operations, they're generating cash because they're making money now. So that's going to eventually get their balance sheet back in order, hopefully as well. Yes. So, no, yeah, the, they, uh, the loyalty deal is interesting because then, and you noted this in your coverage, Jay was, you know, they're, they're raising capital, bringing in Apollo global management, but they are, they said the deals would give them retail, they would retain full control over the flying blue program. And we've noted in the past that, you know, when airlines relinquish control of their loyalty programs, it's, uh, it tends to, to backfire like Air Canada, they they went and <laughs> formed a new loyalty program because they lost control of Aeroplan, then they finally bought Aeroplan back. So and, and who, who was uh, the president you know, of Air Canada when they did that deal? It was Ben I, Smith, who's who's now the CEO of Air France KLM. So he knows all too well the uh, the risks in doing these, you know, and divesting a frequent flyer program. So I think they structure it in a way where they're still going to, you know, retain all the benefits. And this is yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, but that'll be one to watch. So yeah, you know, it's a it's an interesting time. We're uh, we're going to hear from Lufthansa later this week. Uh, we're going to hear from Spirit. So. There's more earnings to come. More fun to come. Oh, yes. Well, Jay, always a pleasure. Listeners, if you want to reach myself, you can reach me at er at skiff.com. You can reach Jay at js at skiff.com. Jay, have a good one. Okay, you too, Ned, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out AirlineWeekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.